Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I want to begin with a statement concerning the divine origins of nations. Where did nations begin? And I want to begin there because I want you to get a concept of where we are at. The divine purpose of God from the beginning was to establish a nation of heaven on earth. That was God's original idea, his plan, his purpose for creating earth was to inhabit the earth. Secondly, the divine goal of God was to establish a colony of heaven on earth. So the vision of God was to have a, a nation on earth from heaven. He wanted to do that to establish a colony of heaven on earth. And his divine objective was to establish the culture of heaven on earth. You should write all of these things down because this is the greatest message that you can share with someone. That God's plan, his idea, his original intention was to establish a country, a nation from heaven on earth to manifest the culture of heaven on earth. His strategy was to do that through establishing the government of heaven on earth. Government, therefore, is the key to establishing a nation. So the primary purpose of government is to establish and administrate the law that regulates life on, in a nation. It also produces the culture of a nation. That last statement is probably the most important I will give you all night. What is the primary purpose of government? Here it is. The purpose for government is to establish and administrate law. And that law regulates the life of the people. And that life produces the culture in that country. So I want you to see the relationship between government, law, people, and culture. Government creates law, law regulates the people's lifestyle, the lifestyle becomes the culture. So the most important component in any country is really the government. Because government controls what happens in the country and what the country becomes. Government also controls the people and what the people become because law regulates the people's lifestyle is this clear so whoever creates the law is a dangerous group of people because they regulate and they create through law that leads me then to the other point the fact that we were created to govern the earth God did that because he knew that in order for earth to become like heaven he had to put us on the earth and put everything under our control and then he gave us his law as the law for earth let's read from the constitution of heaven section psalm section 8 subsection 4 
for those religious people Psalm 8 verse 4 David was a king he was not a, re a religious man he was actually a politician and David asked a question what is man that your mind is full of him oh God why do you think of a man so much and what is so important about the son of man that you actually care about what happens to him and what he's doing and David answers the question himself he says I know why we're so important you made us a little lower than yourself that word beings there's the word Elohim it means God and then you crowned us with what say it loud glory and honor now you've been taught you shouldn't touch the glory of God that's a religious statement that's not a kingdom statement the kingdom actually says you were given the glory of God glory means what it's the word kabod it actually has to do with nature or culture you were crowned with the culture of God with the the nature of God well that makes sense if God wants the nature of heaven to come to earth then he has to put it in the beings who he put on earth because culture is not in land it is in people no piece of your country has culture people carry culture culture is the glory of the people it is the actual nature of the people so whatever the people are happens in the land the Bible says he crowned you with what glory and here's the big one honor that means you were put on a pedestal by God to honor means to lift up to esteem highly to respect the Bible says he crowned you with glory the culture of God and honor God actually respects his creatures he respects his children he's proud of us he's saying go ahead and take the earth look at the next statement it says what you made him to rule or to govern over the works of your hands and you put everything under man's feet do you need any more convincing about why God put you here you didn't come from earth you came to earth you are from heaven and you were sent here to govern the earth on behalf of God in order to bring the glory of God the nature of God the culture of God to earth therefore you are the first government and the only government God put on earth to govern means of course that you execute judgment over a territory judgment has to do with law that means you bring the law of your country to a bear on the environment that you live in so God put you here and put how many things under your feet all things that means every animal every dog every cat every plant every gold silver oil the oceans the mountains the trees you are to rule over the physical planet and bring it under the influence of heaven's culture that's why you were sent here so you are the first government and what is the purpose for government write this down the essence of government is law please remember this the essence of government is law now governments do a lot of things and you think you know that these things are important but the most important thing a government does is to debate and legislate and pass laws right now we got some uh, legislation in the front of our parliamentarians right now dealing with some important issues and some of you may not know the power of what's going on that's why you got to say something because they are about to create law <laughs> when you think of government you must think about law this is why people who are hungry for power in a country want to get into the Congress or the House of Assembly because these are the bodies of authority that create legislation that becomes law so everybody wants to control lawmaking at least a point number two write it down whoever controls or creates the law creates the nation never ignore people who are fighting for laws some of you are wondering why for example there are so many people in our countries around us now who are trying to fight for laws 
to protect same-sex marriages, for example. Now, that is not to be taken lightly. They don't care about your prayer meetings. They don't care about your debates in the church. They want to make sure it becomes law. Because once it becomes law, then the nation becomes a nation of that kind of relationship. Government is about law, and law creates the nation. That leads me to point number three. Law creates and controls culture. What did I say? Law creates and controls culture. So a nation becomes what it will become based on the laws that are created by the people in power. And that group is called the government. They govern the nation by laws. And the law produced the culture. That leads to point number four. So the first thing God gave Moses when he wanted to create a nation out of slaves was law. God gave Moses law before he gave him land. Because <laughs> God knew that if you get land without law, you can have a lawless land. And you cannot regulate land unless you have law. So God gave Moses law first. Then the people got land afterwards. That leads to point number five. Whoever controls the formulation of law controls the quality of the nation. Whoever controls what? The formulation of law. They will control the quality of a nation. Again, you wonder why people want to stay in the position of power. Because when you're in a position of power to create and influence the regulation of a country, you are actually controlling the quality of the country, the values of the country. You're controlling the moral standards of the country. And that leads to point number six, which I think is very serious. The rule of law is at the mercy of those who rule the law. That's a Miles Monroe quote. You tweet that right now to somebody. I'm going to say it again. The rule of law is at the mercy of those who rule the law. Democracy, for example, prides itself on being a philosophy of the rule of law. And what they mean by that is uh, the law rules the country. But we forget that the law that rules the country is created by men who rule the law. So because you say the law rules the country doesn't mean that you can have the right country. Because you might have the wrong law ruling the country. That's how dangerous governments are. Governments can actually rule the rules. They can actually change the rules. Uh, they got the power to legislate and agitate for even the changing of a constitution. Because once you rule the law, and then the law can rule you. So yes, we are about the rule of law, but the question is, who's ruling the law? They can change the law. You ever wonder why the Bible calls the laws of God statutes? Do you know why it's called statutes? The word statute, the same word as character, it's like that statute that you have in the middle of your town. Uh, there's a lady in our country, downtown, she's been sitting there all my life, and many of you were born and she was there. You'll die, she will still be there. She'd been there for over, almost 180 years. She never moved, eh? She's called what? Statue. God used that term for his word, his law. He said, my law are statutes. That means you don't change them by vote. You don't adjust them by any act of human ingenuity. That woman sitting in our square, her name is what? Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. She's been through every hurricane in the Bahamas. Am I right? And never moved. In other words, the currents around her were flowing. But she withstood all the currents. And when the currents were over, she's still the same person. You see, there are a lot of, you know, you ever heard this, uh, uh, this statement? Uh, uh, what, is, what is current in your society? A lot of things are currents. That means they come to move you. And governments need to recognize which laws should not be moved. 
And the only laws that you can guarantee that should not be moved are the ones you get from the Creator. And there are some things the Creator has put in place and we are tampering with them. Now I learned something years ago. If you go downtown to that woman, Queen Victoria, and you say I hate you, and you ball your fists, and you punch her in her face with all your might, because you want to change her, what would happen to your fists? You'd be a bloody mess. Do you know why? No matter what you do, she doesn't go with you. You go with her. You don't break her, she breaks you. All principles and laws are that way. You don't break the laws of God. You break yourself on them. No matter how much we try to change set laws of nature, set laws of physiological facts and truth, we are going to be broken, not the laws. And this is why I don't panic when I see people uh, attempting to shout at God in his face and say to God, this is what we're going to do, no matter what you say. I smile because uh, I know that you cannot change a divine law. And divine laws are always manifested in natural law. And natural law have no respect for human law. Very important. So who, the rule of law is at the mercy of those who rule the law. And that's why even the laws that men create cannot be trusted. That leads me then to what happened when Adam fell. First of all, the first thing God gave Adam was government. The word dominion, as we know, means kingdom authority. God told Adam, have dominion over the earth. We just read it in the book of uh, Psalm 8, verse 4, where God said, you have been given rulership over the earth. So God was giving Adam, first of all, government. Why? Because government is the most important component in leading or influencing territory at least the point number two when Adam disobeyed God he committed high treason that means God trusted Adam with power when you violate the trust of power it is called treason uh, the result of treason is death so the fall of man was the loss of not just a family but he also lost relationship with the government of heaven diplomatic relationship he also lost the commitment of the government to earth and the fall of mankind, therefore, was the recall of the governor of heaven, who is the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit was sent here with us to be the governor in the colony. When we disobeyed the laws of heaven, the governor left. And therefore, the fall of man was the loss of kingdom government of heaven on earth. So we lost a government. Therefore, we lost the nation of heaven. And remember now, we're, gonna, we, we're trying to find out uh, how do you exalt the nations back again? How do you make a nation heavenly again? Or heaven-like again? Well, how was the nation heavenful again? Is that a word? Heavenful? The original nation that was here with Adam was heavenly because the governor of heaven was living in it. The Holy Spirit. Adam was led by the Holy Spirit, not by his flesh. When Adam was following his flesh, he lost that influence from heaven. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, could no longer strive with men. And so the Holy Spirit left. Is that clear? When the Holy Spirit left the earth, the government left the earth. Just like it is in the Bahamas or Jamaica or Barbados or St. Kitts, St. Thomas, St. Lucia or wherever else. Wherever there was a colony, the moment you disobey your governing kingdom, then the governor is recalled. And it happened here in the Bahamas in 1973. And when that governor is recalled, then the influence of that government is gone. The last British governor that was here was in 1973. When that governor left, we lost the control of Great Britain over us. So nothing in the Bahamas is controlled by England. So when you get rid of a governor, you got rid of the government. When the Holy Spirit left the earth because of our rebellion against God, the government of heaven left the earth. Is that clear? So God's purpose was to bring that government back. Now, we know what God did, right? God called a man named Abraham 
Of course, Noah, you know, was the one that he called to save humanity. But then God called a man named Abraham. What did God say to Abraham? Let's look at Genesis 18, verse 18. It's very important to read what God said to him. God says, Abraham, you will surely become great and powerful what? Nation. This is important. Not a religion called Judaism. God's plan was never a religion. Abraham is not the founder of a religion. He is the father of a nation. And God says, Abraham, I will make you a great and powerful nation. Apparently, uh, two things that makes a nation successful. Greatness and power. Now, we got to figure out how to become great and how to, how to become powerful. And God tells Abraham how to do it. He goes on to say, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Can I put it another way? And all the nations of the earth will be influenced by you. Can I put it another way? And all the other nations shall use you as a standard. Why? God only wanted one nation on earth. Why? He only has one race on earth. The only race God has on earth is called the human race. There's no white race, black race, red race, brown race, or yellow race. In the Bible, there's only one race. It's the human race. And God wants that race to be the government over earth. We lost that government. And so God says, Abraham, since I lost all the ethnos, the nations of the earth, I'm going to use you as a prototype to become the standard for all the nations and we know what happened of course Moses picked up that responsibility later and he went to God the people now look at Exodus 19 5 continuing the process if you obey me fully and keep my covenant God says then out of all the nations you will be what a treasured possession and all the whole earth is mine even though I own everything you as a nation will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy what nation again God never told Moses to start a religion He's after what? Nation. Now what is our theme in this session? Exalting a nation. God is concerned about the Bahamas, not about the churches. Oh boy, quiet now. See, look at that. See, the problem is we've been so focused on going to heaven, we forget the assignment on earth. And religion actually abandons earth in its theology. God's first command to man was to have dominion over what? the earth not to go to heaven we came from heaven God says this issue is about you influencing the earth and becoming the nation over earth the governing power on earth so God told Moses you tell them I'm going to make them a royal priesthood that means that's the vertical relationship with God and a holy nation that's the horizontal influence of the people priest means one who stands between God and earth get it Nation means influence over the earth. So holy priesthood means that the people who rule the earth must have a relationship with God vertically. Are you with me? So royal and priesthood are together. Royal and priesthood. Priesthood means vertical. Royal means horizontal. Everybody still with me? You should write that down. Priest means what? Vertical relationship. Royal means what? Horizontal. So for, for me to fulfill God's will as a, a ruler in the earth, I must have a relationship with God first. That's the priestly relationship. Then I can have a royal influence on earth. That's the horizontal part. So every leader in our country should have, first of all, a vertical relationship with God. Then they should be trusted to have a vertical, a horizontal influence over our country and our lives. Therefore, we should not trust people who have power to rule on earth. We should trust people who got a relationship with the power in heaven first. Yeah, you will be what? First, a kingdom of priests. A kingdom is a country, a governing country, a government of a country. And the holy nation is that which is influenced by those priests. So in God's mind, there's no difference between the priest and the king. The king is priest and the priest is king. They are the same in the mind of God. We have a theology where we separated them. And in the Old Testament, if you read the Bible carefully, this is very interesting, eh? Uh, the person who ordained the king 
was always the prophet. The prophet ordained the king. Which means that the person who had a vertical relationship gave permission to the one who had a horizontal relationship. Samuel laid hands on David and Saul. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, we have it differently in our modern countries. We, we go to the attorney general or we go to, you know, somewhere else to get our power. So in other words, the principle is rulership begins with relationship. Write that down. Rulership begins with what? Relationship. If you have a relationship, you are qualified for rulership. If you are a priest first, then you can be a president. If you are a priest, you can be a prime minister. And it doesn't mean that you are religious. It means that you got a relationship with God so you can be in touch with the laws of heaven so that you don't violate the laws of heaven with the laws of earth. And again, this is how you create a nation that exalts the Lord. And God says, you better tell the country about this whole program. Now, I want you then to take a look. What is a nation? What is a nation? We're be talking about nation. Write this down. A nation is a community of people committed to a common heritage, a common language, common land, common jurisprudence, common ideals, common values. And those people are submitted to the governance of one God. Now this last part, we claim as a country to believe that. Till the road we trod, that's how it ends, right? Leads unto a few gods, a number of gods. Apparently in our country we've decided one God. That means it's very difficult for you to have a person in parliament in our country who is an atheist. Because according to the aspirations of our constitution, as well as our national anthem, which manifests our, our anthem, which is our desire that we sing, a person cannot lead us who does not believe in one God. So anyone who is atheistic in their theological perspective of life should not rule our country. If our country wants to have one reference. And so this is an important definition. Let me tell you why God then did what he did. When God brought the people out of Egypt, he told Moses, I want to create a nation out of them. The first thing God gave them was a list of laws. The Ten Commandments. That was the foundation of the creation of God's prototype nation. It was a list of laws. But what's important about the laws, you might have forgotten this, the first law, that, that's the part of the Ten Commandments, the first law in the Ten Commandments is what? Thou shall have no other gods before me. God began with God. He didn't begin with don't steal, don't kill, don't lie, etc. He says, first of all, let's clear who is the ultimate authority. Because if a nation has not declared who its God is, then the laws are at the mercy of the humans. Yes, sir. Without an ultimate reference, everything is relative. Without fear, there can be no wisdom. Oh boy, am I losing you? Okay. If there's no God for you to fear, you will do anything. That's why the fear of God is the beginning of wise choices. That's what it means. If you fear breaking the law of your authority, then it will discipline you in making laws. And this is why people who want to change the laws of God always try to get rid of God first. So they get rid of God out of Parliament, Senate, the law, the courts, the schools. Because if I can get rid of God, then I ain't got to worry about offending any authority so I can make any law I want so that's why the first thing God gave Ab uh, Moses rather was law but the first law he gave him had to do with what the God that they would serve this is why it's so important for the nations to have a clear reference to a God uh, can I put it to you then uh, our preamble of our constitution in the Bahamas is a very important statement with 
in the preamble. And you know, we keep agitating for them to put it in the main part of the Constitution as a law. But they're refusing that because, you know, they say in democracy, which I think is a problem itself, uh, you can't dictate to people who they should believe in. But I think what you should do is declare who you believe in, and then they can come and live with you as long as they don't fool who you believe in. You all sound quiet on me, but then I can try that by myself. Anyhow, you come in my house, you live by my rules. You can live in my house, but my rules. You don't come in my house and bring your own rules. I don't cuss, you don't cuss. That's right. <laughs> you know, so people can come live in the Bahamas, but they shouldn't come and tell the Bahamas what to believe if the Bahamas are, has already declared who its God is. Blessed is the nation whose God is already identified as the Lord. Okay, so if you haven't identified the Lord, then your nation cannot be blessed or exalted. Let me give you the components of a nation. Please write this down. Young people, write this down. What makes a nation a nation? This is very important. Number one, one land. One land. Number two, one national vision. Number three, one language. One language. Number four, one constitution. Number five, one common body of laws. Number six, one government. Let me comment on that for a minute. We have an island in the Bahamas. Those who are watching may not know this. But there's, we have 700 islands in the Bahamas. And there's one of our islands in the Bahamas that has a separate government. And it's not our government. That island is in distress. Because you cannot have two governments in one country. That island is called Grand Bahama. And the government on that island rules a city called Freeport. Now the problem with that is <laughs> two governments can't pre-exist because if it's the same people, you can't have two sets of governing laws and taxes, etc. Uh, any creature with two heads is a monster, they say. And this is why there is confusion in that island in the Bahamas. And the confusion is, is being manifested in the people people are being stressed and so it's very difficult for one government to dictate to the other government if that government has been given governing powers so the moment you have two governments in a country you don't have a country you got a dichotomy frustration that's why God gave you one head in your whole body you got billions of cells with one head with one brain you ain't got no two brains <laughs> you ain't got two minds so it's very important for us to understand that you must have one government. All right, number seven, one common ideal makes a country. An ideal, for example, the ideal of America is freedom. That's the ideal. Everything, everything is freedom. One ideal is freedom. Of course, you got to regulate what freedom is because freedom without law is anarchy. So when you say you want freedom, you got to also immediately want what? Law, okay, which is there, number five. You can't have freedom without laws. Number nine, of number eight rather, countries have the same values, common values. Number nine, number eight, common morals. Number 10, common culture. Number 11, common standards. And number 12, common national commitment to defend the country. And number 13, a nation must have common standard. That's your flag. Matter of fact, the word flag actually in Hebrew is the word standard. Standard. That's why when they went to battle in history, they always send a flag up front. And the person who carried the flag didn't have any weapons, you know. The person who carried the flag had a team around him protecting the flag all the time. And a battle was never lost until the flag of the other army fell. The goal of winning war is to get rid of the flag. The moment the soldier with the flag drops the flag, another soldier grabs it. Why? They can't let the flag fall. You ever heard that? Don't let the old flag fall. Because the flag is the standard. Now the word standard is referring to the personification of the country. So a flag is not just a piece of cloth. That's why if you wear a flag in a certain way on your body, you can go to jail. It's called, they call it des desecration of the flag. If you burn the Bahamian flag, you could go to jail. Because you're burning the people. You're burning the very standard of the country. 
And this is why when you say your flag day, that's not funny. You can't have two flags in one country. Very important. Two flag means two people. Okay? So I want you to understand nations. And I'm sure many of you have seen that picture of, uh, I think it's World War, World War II, uh, when they show those soldiers. There's a statue now where the soldiers are you know, holding this flag up. You ever seen the statue? Yes. That's not a simple statue. Do you know that flags are so important that the entire United States anthem is not about God and it's not about the people. It's about a piece of cloth. But well, you didn't know that, eh? If you sing the National Anthem of America, it's about a piece of cloth. <laughs> the whole anthem is about a cloth. Look at her, she, she's thinking, she's thinking, okay. Can anybody sing it for me? It's about, a, it's about the flag. The whole thing about the flag. I mean, do you know what they sing about? They sing about, they call it old glory. What is glory? The nature of the people. Now, remember during the Civil War, in America, 1776, when they fought the British. The British, remember, they used to, they used to rule America. They just say they ruled us. And uh, the, 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 the Americans who fled uh, Europe fought against the British. They sent them back home. And the whole point was to keep that flag in the air. And when the British ran back, the flag was still standing. They said it was ripped up, but it was still standing. It had holes in it, but it was still standing. So the whole anthem in America is about the standard. Because you've got to have only one standard in every nation. Are you learning something tonight? Amen. So let's sing the National Anthem of America. Can anyone sing it? How does it begin, Pastor Richard? Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. With the, the, notice now, they're talking about dawn's early light. That means... And when, when, when the sun rose that, that morning, the flag was still flying. What's the next verse? Dawn's early light, how proudly we hail. As the twilight was gleaming, whose red stripes and bright stars. See, that ain't no people. Through the perilous night. See, that just, oh, kid's still standing. What's the next verse? Through the ramparts we walked was a gallantly streaming, still flying. And the raft, the first thing in air, come on, sing it. It waved through the night. And our flag was still there. Oh, say that star spangled banner, banner, yeah. And the home of the brick. The whole thing is about a piece of cloth. Now, if you read the Bible, if, if you have a computer Bible, Type in, in search, the word banner, and just press search, and it's all through the Bible. And it's about a flag. So every country must have one flag. Don't ever allow people to bring different flags into your country as a standard. Notice number three, one language. Do you know language is very important because if you encourage diversity of language, you are destroying the country. How did God destroy the Tower of Babel project? He never attacked them. He just confused the language and they could not understand each other so they couldn't even tell the fellow, bring the piece of wood. <laughs> so they couldn't build the country because there were different languages. No country should encourage multiplicity of languages. Now if you read the Tower of Babel, or Babel, it was called Babel because that's the word was used to describe what happened to them. They were babbling. You ever said that? Stop babbling. That means stop babbling. It means the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Confused Language. That's the story in Genesis chapter 11. Read it tonight. It's a story about destroying a country by multiple languages. They started babbling. And this is why it's very important for you as a people, wherever you are as a country, watching this program, to be careful with 
requirements to learn different languages to live in a country. You know, I have no problem with you learning a language for commerce or language for work, but that shouldn't be the standard of the country. Anyone who comes into your country must learn your language. Let me give you one more revelation. <laughs> the first time the Holy Spirit came down to earth in the Bible among men was to destroy the language. That's found in Genesis chapter 11. The first time the Holy Spirit came back to earth was in Jerusalem in a little room. Mm-hmm. And the first thing he brought back was one language. They all speak in tongues. <laughs> in other words, God confused it in Genesis 11, and then he brought back and restored it in Acts chapter 2. So when I travel around the world, and I meet people who I can't understand their native language, as soon as we get in the worship service, they start speaking in tongues, I feel like I'm home. Because tongues is a common language for all who believe. So I go to all these countries with many, many languages, but in a worship experience with God, they start speaking in tongues, and all of us sound the same. He brought back one language. Nothing is more dangerous than people who speak the same language, because now they could believe the same thing. They could say the same thing. It's called unity. Is this good? All right? And then every country must have a common, and this is a very important one, authority reference this is referring to your god you cannot be a country without a single authority reference god says to the children of israel you shall have no other gods before me then he says you'll make no graven images of anything that i created secondly you won't worship any other god god was clear now he said now we can talk about honoring your father your mother don't steal don't steal and you know, all this stuff you know rest once a day i mean once a week make sure take care of yourself you know don't covet but let's first of all clear the air. You only got one God. The reason why that's important is because, and I hope you understand me when I say this, democracy without God is humanism. Yes. 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 What is humanism? Some of you may have studied that in school in college. But humanism is the man being the measure of what is right or wrong, good or bad true or false the human becomes the measure that's humanism in other words the human is god now if you study the concept of democracy democracy is built on humans as the power they say the power is in the people remember that and they say the majority of the people decides what is good or right now we got to decide whether we want to go with that that means no matter how wrong a thing may be if most of the people agree for it they can make it right in their eyes of course so the problem is if there's a God as a reference then if you and I come up with a consideration a, 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 a bill a legislation an idea uh, a law to debate we have to, come, we have to re refer it to his standard. If he's not there, then we decide whether it's right or wrong. That's called humanism. Humanism manifests itself in a word that you want to write down again. Relativism. Relativism. Relativism simply means that things are good or bad based on what's relative to you. It's relative. If I believe it's okay, then you leave me alone. I do what I feel like, and you mind your own business. If, it's, if I like it, I like it. If you don't like it, leave me alone. So that's relativism. Relativism also says that uh, there's no ultimate truth. That truth is uh, relative to the person's perspective. Yeah, situational ethics, they call it. So what is ethical depends on the conditions at the time, which means that there's no standard to measure anything by. Now, many people want this badly because they want to have their own way. A nation that has no reference to measure its right or wrongness against 
is a humanistic nation. Now let me give you the word they use in my country for that. It's the word, write this down, secularism. Secularism is simply humanism dressed up in a nice suit. <laughs> when they say, and I heard them say in our own parliament, we are a secular country. We are a secular nation. What they mean by that is, we don't believe that no one has the monopoly on truth. And that we don't want no one to dictate to us what is right or wrong. So secularism is, is that which is acceptable to me based on what I believe to be right. Even though it might be wrong. Anybody confused yet? That's exactly how you are when you are a humanist. You are confused. Because there's no stake to measure anything by. Now the problem with that is that goes against natural law. Because the whole universe is designed in such a way that God has established permanent stakes that you cannot violate. For example, your mouth and your eye and your teeth are specifically designed to fulfill certain duties. Your eye cannot hear. It has a limitation. There's a law of the eye. It cannot hear. It cannot talk. So you and I can vote that the eye should, should hear. And we can win the vote. 90% agree the eye should hear. What happens to the eye? I told you that natural law have no respect for human law. So there is a stake in the ground. What we need to do as nations is study the stakes. That's why God told Moses, these are the stakes. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's goods. Thou shalt not uh, kill. Thou shalt not kill yourself without working and resting. He gave specifics. These are stakes. And by the way, grace doesn't cancel law. So be careful with the grace message. Grace frees you to keep law. It doesn't cancel law. You are free to not commit adultery. <laughs> you are free to never lie again. That's grace. So we need to have a reference to have an exalted country. And this is why it's important for the role of those who are the, can I use the term guardedly please? Uh, those of us who have the stewardship of maintaining the presence of God in the country, in the national psyche. Those people must be protected. And if those people are silent, then the voice of God is silent. Therefore, the reference is silent. And therefore, men do things that are unbelievable. The Bible says there's a way that seems right unto men. That's, that's humanism. If it's right for me, it's okay. That's humanism. And so, we don't have the right to decide what is right. That is pre-established. <laughs> you and I are not here to debate with God, but to obey God. Am I coming through a little bit? So nations need to understand that. Now, here's a question I ask, and I want you to write the answer down. What aspirations the nations have? What are the aspirations of nations? The three aspirations all nations have. One is freedom. Freedom is defined as the right to pursue your personal aspirations and practice individual convictions within the boundaries of constitutional law. Please buy this CD to get all this with. What is freedom? The right. I say it together. What is freedom? The right to pursue personal aspirations and practice individual convictions within the boundaries of constitutional law. That's national freedom. The second aspiration of nations is independence what is independence let's say it together independence is the national right of a people to determine their national destiny to pursue their national aspirations and practice their national ideals within the context of their national constitutional law and i think in this particular sentence the word there would be more important to me their national laws because there are other countries now who are imposing on their national laws. I read a statement that was sent to me that the 
Vice President of uh, the United States made concerning uh, the relationship of the U.S. with other nations. And I think that statement crossed a serious boundary because the statement is implying, not even implying, it's actually blatantly stating that if nations do not line up with certain so-called laws that are you know, common laws in, 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 in the global environment, then they will be victims uh, and they will be punished by the community of nations. And what they're doing is they are ignoring any national law for the sake of global laws. And they are literally holding you hostage by the purse. It's called global blackmail. And the purpose for the global blackmail is to make you a prostitute. If you got to do whatever I tell you to do because I give you money, you are a prostitute. So that's where we are. How can we be an exalted nation if we cannot choose the laws that God gave us? These are questions that I believe are coming to a head in the next 25 years. I believe that it's going to be global contention based on moral clashes. I believe that there's going to be a global rebellion against the spirit of conformity. Because I believe that there's a certain point where people with moral convictions will lose their timidity. And there's going to be a global revolution. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm prophesying right now. Because the human spirit can only take so much. When you study history, there always was a point where people said, enough is enough. And they didn't care what price they had to pay, they rose up. That leads to my third aspiration. Sovereignty. Wow. Every country wants to be sovereign. But what is sovereignty? Out loud, read. Sovereignty is the right to self-governing, supreme national authority, not ruled by any other state. Now that's exactly what sovereignty is. And that is a tough one. You can supposed to be able to decide your own destiny as a country and become your own supreme authority in the execution of your own national aspirations, but what happens if someone says to you, you can't do that? You're no longer sovereign. I believe in independence. I believe in interdependence. What I don't believe in is control of other countries. And that control can be done different ways. You can control people by blackmail. It can be economic blackmail. So I want you to understand, as we talk about the kingdom of God influencing countries, there's going to be a clash. And you sitting here tonight in this class and those watching this program tonight, I promise you there's going to come a time before you die when you're going to have to make a decision that is so serious that your little quiet voice is going to have to become loud and your hiding in the closet will be over because it will be a matter of you losing your entire life's conviction or fighting for it. And you got to decide uh, who will you serve? And by the way, there came a point when Israel had to do that. Remember, choose you this day. Not what you will serve. You need a reference. Who you will serve. Because whoever you serve will dictate your standards, your laws, your conviction as a country. And you're going to have to say one or the other. As for me and my house, I'm going out to fight. When you conform, you become useless. Can you write that down? When you, be, when, when you conform, you lose your influence. Be not conformed to this world, Paul says. But be transformed by the renewing of the way you think. Renewing means going back to the original way of thinking. 
So we got three things we must deal with as a country. Freedom, independence, and sovereignty. And we as a country will have to deal with these important issues. Are you, are you with me? I mean, you talk about exalting a country, a nation being exalted. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation. We're going to deal with this in the next two sessions because it's so important to understand what righteousness is. It's really aligning yourself with the laws of God. Righteousness exalts a nation. We've been taught that you should be righteous. According to the Bible, the country should also be righteous, not just the people. But the whole nation must be lined up. And the way a nation becomes righteous is you must have people in government who are aligned with the laws of God. Because government is just a machinery. It's as good as the people in it. So if the people in government are not aligned with the laws of God, then you have a corrupt government. Therefore, the nation will not be exalted. Righteousness exalts a nation. Right standing with God exalts a nation. Right standing with God's laws exalts a nation. But sin, it says. Sin, the word sin is a singular word. Sin. Not sins, sin. The word sin there is the word rebellion against the laws of God. How the word in Hebrew means? To sin means to rebel against the known laws of God. That's the word for sin. So when the Bible says do not sin, it's saying do not rebel against the laws of God. Sin is a reproach to every country. So when you make laws, you must check to see if those laws are not creating sin. What is sin? Rebellion against the known laws of God. I saw something on the television, Fox News today, very interesting. A lady was on and she was presenting a case to the US government. And she had this, uh, this video, a live video of a baby in the womb of a mother. And it showed for the first time a baby in 3D. A little child in the womb. And they showed that this child, this baby, was actually doing human things. <laughs> it's like four weeks. This this this, this creature, this so-called you know, blood, was a human, and all the people sitting there in that hearing were quiet. And she simply said, "Is that a human?" And nobody answered. I think it's going to be on the news tonight again. She showed for the first time that they went inside the womb and took a 3D. You know, normally they would scan, you know, you see the thing moving. But this thing went inside and actually showed the 3D of the baby. And this little child was sucking his thumb, you know, scratching. And they were like, this is not just some blob. It's an actual human. So when you abort that, you are killing a child, a human. But she, instead of arguing the case, she just showed the movie. And everybody was quiet. Here's my point. When you create a law in a country as a nation, you have to make sure that that law is not rebellion against the known will of God. What did God say? I wish that none perish. Psalm 139. I saw you in your mother's womb. I knew you when you were in the depths of her earth. I made you wonderfully beautiful. And I already wrote a book on you. Yes. This is Psalm 139. You should read it sometime. Before you was conceived, I knew you. So when you make a law, when you debate laws, and I'm sure ours is coming, you know, some of you are thinking, well, that's them. No, it can come. Because there are doctors in our country who are already aborting babies by the hundreds. Hundreds of them. We just don't know about it. Matter of fact, they hide it pretty good lately. But they, is that murder or, or what is that? I mean, thou shalt not kill. It's a question. What is killing? And, and, and when, does, when is killing not killing, I don't know.
think killing is when you kill me. I think that's what that means. You terminate my life. Yeah, terminate my life. And what could be worse than terminating someone who cannot defend themselves or speak for themselves or even resist? Is that worse than killing? Is that law in keeping with the standard of God? Righteousness exalts a nation. The culture of death could be created by a law where the value of human life doesn't matter. You may wonder why, maybe why a young kid could walk into a school and open a machine gun on little kids in the prep school and kill 10 of them, 18 of them, and then walk out. Is there a culture of death because of the laws of the country that made life use, useless? Because you devalue life to the point where if it's inconvenient, you kill. Maybe that kid who had the gun may have seen enough of that where he says these kids are inconvenient now you go to jail for doing it outside the womb who goes to jail for doing it inside the womb these are questions you have to answer you do it inside the womb they call you a doctor outside the womb they call you a criminal it just depends on where you do it. You are called skillful if you do it inside the womb. You are called brutal if you do it outside the womb. It depends on, I guess, the location. I believe you are here because you survived the womb. I read in a book some years ago, it says the most dangerous place for a baby today is in its mother's womb. May God have mercy on our countries. Righteousness exalts a nation. I have 89 slides. This was slide number six today. Let us pray. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.